Canadians don't have the right to a healthy environment because the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms doesn't include any such right. Or does it? Ada Lockridge and Ron Plain believe that it does. Ada and Ron are members of the Omgenong First Nation, a native community in the heart of Ontario's notorious Chemical Valley, which pumps out more air pollution than the entire provinces of Manitoba, or Saskatchewan, or New Brunswick. With the worst air in Canada, Omgenong suffers from really alarming health problems, including high levels of leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, asthma, and miscarried pregnancies. So Ron Plain and Ada Lockridge, aided by the environmental law organization EcoJustice, launched a lawsuit in 2010 arguing that their charter rights to life, liberty, and security of the person and equality are being violated by the Ontario government's permission for the expansion of these toxic industries. If they win, Ron and Ada will have shown that you and I, and all Canadians, do have the right to a healthy environment, a right that has never before been a meaningful part of Canadian law. We have what every other community in Canada or North America has, we just have more of. Uh, more cancers, more respiratory problems, more cardiovascular problems, we just have more of. Uh, and uh, they, uh, in quotations, say it's because we you know, drink too much, smoke too much, party too much, it's all lifestyle, it's our fault. Uh, they don't take into account at all the fence line that surrounds us. We have a lot of breathing problems, learning disabilities, behavioral problems, a lot of miscarriages. And you have this odd thing, which I would have thought was inarguable, you're, that you're having, you're not having an even division among, between the sexes among the, the children Birth that are patient. born. Tell me about that. Well, this one doctor had uh, looked over, we were trying to fight the Suncor's ethanol plant. And they asked if we had any uh, previous health issue, uh, health surveys or anything done before. And um, so we, we did back in, I think it, they called it the 96 study. But the one scientist, biologist, he had looked at it and said there was a lot of mercury that was coming up. And he asked if there was any um, birth ratio differences. And the one guy had said, well, we've um, we had three girls baseball teams to one boy, so we could only fill the one. And he goes, "Wow, this is interesting. Can you find out?" We said, "Well, yeah, because to be a member of our First Nation, you have to apply, you know, and show who your parents are or whatever to be on there." So they said, "Can you go get the records and go back and see what was happening, what's going on?" So somebody handed me the our membership list. And I just went through it for each year. We went back to 1984. Yeah, I think 84. And so I just girl boy for each year. And then I handed the, the doctors and the other people the information. And um, they put it in the months or uh, what do you call that? You know, three months, every four months, see what's happening. And yeah, and I think it was in the 95 or something when it really started changing. Like the girls were overwhelming the boys. See, I never noticed, because you see boys and girls everywhere, you know, but apparently it wasn't at the rate as everybody else in the world is having their children. That's really, that's really startling. I mean, that's, that's kind of like, um, that's not something that everybody else in the country has, right? That's a unique that's situation here. It, yeah. It's Chernobyl or something like that. Yeah, it Chernobyl. did happen, but that was a specific incident that had happened. In Chernobyl, but the so what? Uh, when this came out, that that article, uh, she gave the data to people, and collectively they submitted it to Environmental Health Perspectives. And the day that came out online was when our phones started to ring for interviews and studies and everything else from all um, over the world. It was like, oh my God, what did we start? Oh my God, what happened? Because we There's were the first human it. population, um, and. and after our study came out, there was some people from Asia who did a study of the Asian countries and then they did a study of the North American countries and then a guy from Greenland did a study around the Arctic Circle. And what they found is throughout the world this is happening, but nowhere near to our extent. And, and um, it's been called the, the, the first step to extinction <clears throat> because if we can't uh, uh, procreate with our own and, and not to make it into a, a, a racial statement, but um, we're going to water down our race of people to the point to where the government's going to say that you're no longer Indians. Yes, yes. And, and so to take it into a social atmosphere, it's a, 
But is, would, would this be also happening to other people in Sarnia? I mean, do we know anything about that? Because <laughs> you know. when we did ours, then city of Sarnia didn't like that. So they did, uh, they went through the birth records at the hospital and they did all of Lambton County together. So it watered everything down. Anybody that it's the North End and that, you know, that it's not waved in by or anything. So it washed it right out. And I was very upset with them then too, because they did different year slots than us. And I said, you know, if you're going to do it, you would do it the same years to match up with ours. Why would you totally, you're just purposely doing that to mess things up. And then when I had a chance to talk to Health Canada and they said, yeah, that's exactly how you're supposed to do it. Match it year to year, if anything. Uh, county birth rates are fine was the big, bold headline in the paper when they released that study, mm -hmm. trying to refute everything that we say to make it an Indian problem. That's been their goal all the way along. It's an Indian problem. That way they can blow it off by saying it's, it's, it's lifestyle. Um, and it's, it's our own fault that what it is. But it's not only us, there's all kinds of people throughout the valleys, South Sarnia, Corona, all the way down to Wapool, who still get affected. We may get the waste, wafting of airs going by more frequently than anybody else. And that's the issue. Was it a one-time thing? Was it a one specific incident that happened? It happened? Or is it a lifetime of all this building up in you, the cumulative effects? Thing, so is anybody studying that seriously at this point the, the cumulative effects well studying what what, the, what what accounts for this anomaly I mean well they know what each chemical does by itself yeah, yeah. but they don't know what the mixture of the chemicals can do to anybody mm -hmm. so we haven't revisited that uh, the birth ratio in quite a while but I'd like to see it happen again because was because if it's okay now and if things have changed that you have to look back nine months prior to when all these births were, it was so dramatically changed, right? So you can think that there was something, one incident that happened. But other than that, we don't know. But to take it beyond that, um, there's a, a, a new field in science called epigenetics. And in epigenetics, they've proven absolutely that it, skips, it can skip a generation. So it could have been something that my father um, or my grandfather would have had, or my grandmother would have had, that skipped and now it's in me. But there is nobody that I know of right now studying uh, the impacts of Chemical Valley on Amgenong anymore uh, that relates to our, our birth ratios. Yeah, so what you're gonna have is a situation where you feel quite confident that you've got a, 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 a whole range of health effects affecting the, whole, the entire population, every age, both sexes, and so on. And, and you've got health authorities saying to you that this is just a lifestyle oh yeah matter, I've, right? I've heard yeah. that so many yeah. times i get so angry and i'll say okay unless you're talking lifestyle choices as uh the food we eat the pots and pans that we cook our cleaning products our you know my shampoos and stuff like that if that's what you mean fine but don't you dare say anything because it's our drugs or alcoholism because we were compared to another first nation when we did the birth ratio and they're not far from here they live the same lifestyles as us but they're not in direct thing and they were fine you know they're the same size community as us and you know so what's the difference there why are they different and they're okay so now you've been fighting this thing i mean i i it seems to me that an impartial observer would have to say there's something having to do with the fact that you have what's said to be the worst air in canada if it's not the worst it's bloody close, right? Um, pretty bad. You're surrounded by all these petrochemical plants and we know all the petrochemicals have, a, or uh, many of them have many different health effects. And you've been fighting this for <coughs> a long time, right? And, and in a lot of ways. Can we go back over a little bit of what that frustrating process has been? Because you alluded to that a little earlier. Um, I, I don't want to say that it's been really frustrating. One of the very positive things out of it is we work together really well. She has a, a, a really unique gift of sitting at a coffee table and answering all your questions and extracting questions out of you so that when she leaves your house you are better informed and she did that through the whole community and I don't have that gift. My gift is working my way into places where I'm not supposed to be like the Minister of the Environment or uh, uh, you know rubbing hands with, with the Crime Minister or 
sitting down with Suzuki saying, well, this is what's going on. Why aren't you coming down to Amgenau? We have two different gifts that complement each other so well. So there hasn't been a lot of frustration other than the fact that in my view, there's been no change. Yeah, and you've said that, that there's been no change and that you think there will be no change. Well, I, I sat on the NPR, the National Pollution Release Inventory Working Group, which all of these companies have to report to this organization. And in their own uh, data, they're worse now than what they were 10 years ago. They're releasing more today than what they were 10 years ago. But when you read the propaganda that the media prints, they say, well, it's better today than what it was in the past. I hear it's cleaned up 90% from what it used to be. And I said, well, good God, what did I live through then? Because all my bucket samples, my air samples that I take, shown what chemicals are there and at what levels that are not accepted anywhere in the States. They were above any accepted levels in the States. And then we tried to compare what's accepted here. We found there was no, um, there was no standards for long-term health-based standards for a lot of these chemicals, benzene being one of them, and um, butadiene one and three. And then once we started uh, showing what was in our air that we're capturing, then the government decided to make some standards for these chemicals. But there were none at all prior no. to that. No, I didn't know that. See, I wouldn't, I, I didn't know the laws. I figured the government and that whoever put these industries here, if somebody was policing them, you know, somebody would be taking care of it. Because that's what you're taught. Yeah. You're in good hands. Well, that's what I, that's what made me so upset that I've lived here pretty much my whole life. I went into school in Sarnia every day. I never learned none of this. And, and what I did learn was very little and it'd be from the people that who actually worked in the industries that what they would share with you. And that was all I ever knew. All I was ever told growing up was that when those flares are going and the big flames, that's a good sign because it's better to be burning up there than being down here in the ground. And so that never sat right with me. Oh, okay, you know. We found out the exact opposite is yeah, the truth, right? That, yeah, I didn't know that when they're burning, that they're having problems is what it is. Because Suncor, just um, north of me here, that flare, that, their flare was huge my whole life. It was huge. And um, one day, it, I couldn't see it. So I called down there. I go, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Your flare's not going. What's happening in there? Oh, 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 oh wait. And I said, what, what do you mean? She says, no, no, there's still a little flare. It's just a little pilot light. But I didn't realize it was because of all the noise that we're making here why that flare has gone down. I, like, I, it just naturally ran that way and we start questioning things. So, but now I goes, that thing flared thought my whole life. We could walk through the bush and you didn't need a flashlight. But now what's changed, that flare is down, but they got four or five flares going now. I go, so can you tell me the difference of that big, huge one to four or five little ones? But I, you know, I know stuff is, certain stuff is being sent that one's, you know, they're burning different things on each flare, I guess. But. So let me come back to Ron's uh, um, activities, because you've been engaged, you've, you have been inserting yourself into places where you're not supposed to be for a long time, <laughs> right? right? And you've, uh, you've also, you've been on all kinds of committees and in all kinds of task forces. And tell me a bit about that, because my, uh, where I'm going with this is, is that in a way, the suit is almost like the last resort, right? Um, it sounds to me like you've gone through all the processes that you're like supposed to go through. I, I, I don't know if the last resort is the way I wanted to word it, but yeah, we, we, we followed every step. We uh, consulted with the community. We brought what the community was thinking out. Um, when Justin and uh, Eco Justice came over, um, we were pretty well armed. I mean, Ada opened up her books and said, here's everything that you're gonna ask for. And it, everything was in there. So, uh, you know, we asked the, the Minister of the Environment to uh, review what was going on here, and, and they called it hot spots, and um, they gave us no responses to these reviews. Um, years into it, we still don't have really a response from it. We, we've had the Ministry of Environment <coughs> down, and we take them on a toxic tour, and they're going, why is there so many flares? Why is this? Why is that? I, oh my God, why are you asking me? These guys are the ones who approve this stuff. And, the, you know, uh, like the one time they're riding around, I was taking them after a meeting and they says, oh, look at Ada's toxic, taking a bunch of toxicologists on a toxic tour. And I goes, yeah, and you better keep quiet and listen because this is going to be a short run. You listen to what I have to say while we do it. So they kept quiet. 
<laughs> I ran into them later because after everything, um, well, the government decided they're going to do this 419 initiative and come up with some long-term health-based standards for some of the chemicals. So we were invited out and they're all big, big wig industry folks and government folks and health representatives from everywhere except for Sarnia. They were from everywhere else. And I walked in, I was a little bit nervous and then I thought, hey, these people are just the same as me you so no I'm gonna say whatever I have to say I might not know it all but I know when I can speak up and say something and it was interesting because the one guy he was um, Canadian Petroleum Producers Inc but I was sitting at a table and they strategically placed everybody at tables right so you know a person from each group was there at each table so the guy was talking to me he said something weird and I said who are you anyway like who are you? Are you industry or are you government? And I went to look at his name tag and he turned. I said, well, who are you? And he turned again. And I said, excuse me, is there secrets in this room? Because this guy's not saying who he is. And he goes, oh my God. He goes, all right, my name is so-and-so. And then they were talking and I forget what, what had brought it up. And I goes, hey, is this where I would say where they share their credits, like their pollution credits, they can pump out so much? And the guy goes, no, no, that's not where you say it. Just sit down and be quiet. And I was, hey, this guy's telling me to be quiet. And so they brought me the microphone. So I asked and everybody, what, what? Because nobody knew about this pollution credit sharing or whatever. And there, a lot of questions came up and I just elbowed him. I goes, I guess it was the right time to bring it up. And he goes, you know, <laughs> he was a big dude, but it, Anyway, they were all glad to see me gone and I wasn't supposed to come back the next time. But I came and they're all, oh, either they put their head down or they sat up straight because, you know, I, I'm just there. I want, I'm on to help and I want the truth. Well, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a way in which the whole economy is kind of focused right here, right? I mean, this, this is the biggest, most powerful yeah. so why, piece of the So why are the, all these big wigs, these Ministry of Environment out in Toronto and in places, they should be right here and with more monitors. Now we got an air monitor after finding stuff in my bucket sampling where we were finding all this stuff. So they, it was $380,000. So the provincial and federal government and Om Chinong chipped in to put this state-of-the-art air monitor in but we could only have one and where's the perfect place? Well, you know, it's a little hard when all industry that is surrounding us. So we did come up with one spot. When we've had a couple of shelters in place, that thing isn't picking nothing up. One time the smell was so bad right there, like on a stink scale of one to 10, it was a 12 or 13 and it burned. And the Ministry of, Engar Env excuse me, Ministry of Environment guy was standing right there. He goes, I couldn't, sm he couldn't smell anything. So I said, that guy, it's time to change. I retire his nose he's t it's time for him to go if he can't smell that and that monitor didn't pick it up and they couldn't figure out where it was coming from so i guess you know well the wind was coming from this way and i goes okay i just happen to have a uh, an article in the newspaper that said you guys gave permission for these guys to store this stuff under those wells uh underground caverns or whatever and he goes what does it say ada so i told him he goes, Okay, that probably helps a lot. It was that company. And it, that was at that Providence, and then they're gone. They right change here. names here routinely. <clears throat> um, we'll take you to a plant in a little while that, that uh, was first called Nova Chemicals, and then it was called Ineos Nova, then it was called Ineos Styrenix, then it was called Styrolution. This is in a two year period. But if I'm to sell you my car now, it has to pass an emissions test. I can buy a refinery and all of the certificates of approval are grandfathered with that. So there's, uh, there's certificates for refineries that don't exist anymore. It's just empty land now, but there's still certificates available for it. So if you lease the land, you get the certificates that were issued in 1978 or whatever it was. And if you <coughs> choose to build a new refinery, the certificates apply? Yeah, absolutely. Well, not a brand new one, they have to do all... If it's not on the existing site. No, no, but if you're building a new one on that site right. where the certificate's applied. Because yes. Shell, Shell was going to build, they were wanting to build another great big plant down south of us. And we were working with them. We were working with the provincial and federal crown reps. And we, they were meeting with us weekly. They were meeting with uh, 
Wapul Island, another First Nation just south of us, and we would work with them. And um, yeah, I had taken that air sample and all those three different benzenes had came up. So when they came to meet with us, I goes, hey, boys, did you get the newspaper today? And they said, Ada, the whole office got the newspaper. We did this little form on where benzene can come from. And they go, cigarettes? I was, Nobody was smoking. And they go, but from car emissions? I goes, the car was shut off. We were in front of the car and there was like three cars that went by. And so anything that they were trying to bring up, that benzene, yeah, whatever. It was there that night. It was burning your nose. It was this and that. So anyway, we worked really hard with that one. And that plant went away too. Well, it's gone away for now. But yeah. she brings up something that's really funny because uh, the denial of industry and government are, are, are uniform. It's the exact same rules. Uh, and, and the best example of it, Louisiana, uh, British Petroleum BP, um, at, as a result of a lawsuit, ended up having to put butterfly clip air monitors so every so many feet all the way around the perimeter of their fence line. So it caught truly everything coming out of the refinery. And what it showed was the numbers were much higher than um, they were reported to be. And uh, I could find the paper somewhere, but uh, it was in the, the, the town newspaper that BP blamed the car traffic driving around the refinery to check out the new butterfly clips for the rise in emissions. And that's what gets printed. That's what John and Jane Q public hear. Shell had a hydrogen sulfide leak. And my daughter had come here in the morning, so I went out and got my bucket and I took a air sample and I called over and I said, I'm taking a sample. And they said, our monitors aren't picking up anything. And with my sample, we have to ship it to California and it costs $500 for it to be analyzed. It takes about 10 days. And yes, the hydrogen sulfide showed up there above any levels accepted in the States. And so. You've got a, an incinerator here that is actually burned and buried toxic wastes that are too toxic to be uh, to be dealt with in the States. I mean, they mm -hmm. have to be shipped out of the States to be dealt with, right? Yeah, uh, it's called Clean Harbors. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, it was uh, it had a different name. I can't think of what it was called. I want to say liquid cargo, but... No. Um, Safety Clean. That's it. Clean Harbors, yeah, yeah. it's all... Um, I didn't realize how bad Clean Harbors was until a couple of guys came up doing a documentary on, on the Clean Harbors Corporation from New Jersey. And uh, they were blown away by what they saw at the facility here. Um, it's, that's the facility where I, I went to an open house and the reporter said, what am I doing here? This doesn't impact Amgenong. And it's 11 kilometers away from us. Um, so. The, they want to keep everybody isolated. I so you're, and your you're, Amgenom is completely surrounded by, uh, by petrochemical activity, and you've got some of it that Amgenom surrounds it, too. Yep. Tell me a little bit about the layout here, because I think that's hard to, hard to grasp, but you, the, 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 the two are so interwoven like that. Um, I, I won't go into the whole history of the land transactions that allows it to be. But as we drove past the graveyard, I showed you that it is completely surrounded by industry. So if it's a donut, the graveyard's the donut hole. And you go over to Scott Road and you'll see that there's two plants there. There's an old uh, called Welland Chemicals, which is abandoned, and the Ontario Hydro Facility across the road. They're the donut hole that are completely surrounded by Amgenon. And there's no logical way as to how this came to be, and it has to do with transactions that took place uh, almost a decade ago, I'm sure. <laughs> Mayor Mike would, from Sarnia would tell you, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have built so close to Indus. Uh, we wouldn't have built so close to a First Nations and <laughs> stuff like that. He says it all the time. Yeah, but, yeah. But it's there, you know. Um, but they can use better technology <laughs> and, uh, you know, spend some money to fix the, the problems up. Yeah, but I mean, I, what interests me in, in, in a way is how do we get here? I mean, how do we get to this situation where... Uh, oh, when where we had our Indian agents and that we were going to sell the land, that what we, uh, from what I've been told is that we were going to sell the land so industry could come, so that there'd be jobs and bring people here to, to work. And even on economic terms, has it been good for Amsterdam? Mm, I say no. We argued one time, jokingly, um, or maybe not jokingly, mm -hmm. 
uh, of how many actual band members work for industry, not for a union that occasionally goes into industry, but work for industry. And, and I would say five and she would say seven. And I mean, that's it. In yeah. a population of... Well, well, our whole total population is like 2,000 now, yeah. but approximately 800 on the reserve. Yeah. So... Um, so yeah, five or six full-time employees of an industry, but other than that, we do have like uh, mill rights, we have, you know, pipe fitters, we have, you know, the union guys that but do But they're not jobs. exclusive to the plants. They could be working for hydro one day, the plant, the next day, the school board, the next day. Right. Um, in the 50s and 60s, there was a negotiated uh, Aboriginal hiring policy with the plants at Chemical Valley. And at the time, um, quite a few of our members got work underneath that. Uh, and in the 70s and 80s, it stopped. And, and we asked in a public meeting why it stopped, and there was no response other than we don't exercise those policies in our Corona facility. That's what the general manager of Shell said. So um, we don't have people working in the plants, and, and that's a bad thing because when the people worked in the plants, they stood up for us. Hey, you can't do that, man. That's flowing down river to Amgenong. And we don't even have that protection inside the plants anymore. But uh, to make a statement that we don't exercise these policies in our Corona facility means we're just not going to hire you. Yeah, and, and you'd had a negotiated agreement. Right. But they, there was no negotiation to right. well, uh, hey, But now they say... Name me an agreement that, that uh, non-Aboriginals or settlers have, have kept with an Aboriginal community. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Now yeah. they say, uh, what is it, um, so when you're filling out an application, they can't ask you your um, race or anything like that anymore? But, but if you do, you may get a job. Try putting the name Plain down on an application. Yeah. The only Plain family, you know. There, there's a German Plains, and that's it, the rest are ours. So unless you're from that, you know, it's, it's... Now the argument is made, that, that if you were to enforce the, if you were to enforce more stringent standards in terms of emissions, and, uh, and I guess we're really primarily talking about air quality, although there is certainly some water, yes. some major water issues too, eh? um, that the industries would get up and go away. And, and you did, you, you know something about that from Massachusetts. Tell me about it. Tell yeah, me about um, well, it's been the argument here all along, um, that if we pushed this, then industries would go away. But I have to preface it by saying, we never asked for new regulations. We asked them to enforce what exists. When that happens, then we can talk about strengthening. But they don't enforce what exists right now. But uh, in Massachusetts, they created what they called the Toxic Use Reduction Strategy, or the TURI program. <clears throat> what that said was chemical, or company A uses chemical B in its process. We know chemical B causes cancer. So find a way to remove chemical B from your process. And when they announced that they were going to do this program, uh, all of the companies in Massachusetts said there would be a mass exodus. We will just all leave. And the program started, and it, they didn't leave. One company out of Massachusetts left, and, and uh, Rachel Massey and David Ackerman did the study. You can Google it. Um, they did it for the U.S. Department of Labor that showed that every plant inside of Massachusetts that utilized the Turi program hired more, produced more, and profited more because they found less expensive ways of producing with less harmful chemicals. Now it's not a hundred percent, there's chemicals that they couldn't replace, I'm sure, but there was a success story to it that just couldn't be repeated. So here in Ontario a few years ago they came up with the idea of doing a toxic production strategy and I sat on that working group and we went to meetings after meetings after meetings and every meeting all of these companies would be there. And they would say that we can't give you the information of what chemicals we use because it's proprietary. But these guys manufacture the same things as these guys, as those guys, as these guys. So it's not really proprietary. And you have to report it all to certain government forms anyway. So it's public knowledge at the end of it. They just don't want to have to do it. When we sent the people to Europe and they came back with the apples to apples comparisons and said in Scandinavia, they're 90% less emissions, 90% that tells me that they don't care and neither does the government they can do business better we're not going anywhere Amgenong's been here since we began and industry we don't expect industry to be gone anywhere no. I've asked she's asked be a good neighbor 
That's all. And you know it's possible because you've seen it done elsewhere. If, if, even if it isn't possible, to not even try means you've given up before you started. Yeah, yeah. One and of it's the a first callous disregard for your neighbors, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a thing <coughs> when we first started working. It was against the Suncor uh, ethanol plant. But when we started working, and there, somebody handed me a paper of these two ladies. I don't know if it was Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. Two ladies, they, wa they went after industry and government and wanting them to reduce their emissions and stuff. So they worked really hard. The one lady ended up dying of whatever her cancer and the other lady promised to go on and they did. And so the, um, the whatever they were allowed to pump out this much, the government changed it that they could only pump out this much, but then the industries weren't even pump pumping out that much. So they can work together, like, but it's all the hard work and everything because I'll tell government and industry, why do you make me work so hard? I don't know this stuff, but once you make me work hard to find out, then I have to put it out there, wherever, the papers, the news, wherever, and then you will work on it. Why do you keep doing this? You already know this stuff. Why do you, they just frustrate yeah. me and you know, I'm stressed and whatever. Well, in a sense, why should we've seen this? And when you see our, the agriculture thing, you'll see a much lower scale version of this. But mm -hmm. essentially, there's the community going out, doing its own research, you know, mm -hmm. and and finding out, um, you know, things that the government should know and mm -hmm. maybe even does know, mm -hmm. um, and it still doesn't have much much an effect. But why does the citizen? Is the citizen the person yeah. that has to go and right. and I recognize with the First Nation. The word citizen may not be the appropriate <laughs> one, but you know what I mean. Just a, mm -hmm. you know, the, a, a, a person going on with their lives, mm -hmm. it's business. This is not right. right. Still has to go but and do that. The, yeah. the former MP here um, said to me one day that I'm not his constituent. That I'm not the one who is knocking on his office door in Ottawa every day. It's industry. Now, kudos for honesty, but you're an asshole. <laughs> you know, we still are underneath your umbrella here. And it's not just we. When, when we say we, when we go to town, people buy us a coffee. Some people call us names. Some people shake our hands. You know, there, there's, there's Nobody's a Nobody's ever done that to my face. <laughs> they might do it to him, but they're usually pretty good. They're always thanking me and thanking me on behalf of their whole community and stuff like that. So, well, I was thinking so you've got to have some neighbors oh, who are very grateful oh, for their They, they yeah. call me, yeah. the, if something's going on, they call me to find out what's going on because they can't get the information. They have to apply to the freedom of information thing and all I got to do is call up, tell me to ask, tell me what I got to ask and I'll ask. Mm. And who you do know. you call, the plant? I call them, yeah, the plants, the MOE, whoever. Yeah. I call them all. I, like uh, when I go to these meetings, those big wigs are handing me their cards and who oh, wait, oh, I'll call them. Hey, I met you. Um, you said you could help me, so I'm wondering. And they'll set up meetings or whatever. And they'll actually answer the yeah, questions. Yeah, because I'll, I'll say, yeah. you know, I'm tired of talking to the little people. I want to talk to the boss, you know, because I'm not getting anywhere with those other people. But and then if they give me, you know, sass or you know, like there was an incident here. We were shelter in place. And our emergency response plan. Explain what shelter in place means, please. Oh, shelter in place. Well, okay, so there's something happening in the valley. So you're supposed to go indoors, shut your doors, windows, and listen to the radio to hear what's going on. This is a, this is a, a policy, a procedure that's just across the valley? Does that, this applies to everybody? It right? goes across yeah. Canada, but yeah. well, they issue a shelter in place to a region, so it could be here, it could be over there. Well, depending on which way the wind's blowing and which company, so they got a little map and so they can see which way it's going to go. So, what was my thought of? So, they're, they're basically saying there is toxic stuff going on. We've had an incident. Get out of here, yeah. right? Get well, out, no. Get, get they quit, they get. quit sending us away ever since we started this. We started to complain because a lot of the things, I guess, because if you go outside and you start the car, it could spark something, you know, a, an explosion or something like that. So they say it's better for you to stay in instead of being exposed. So she had mentioned the shell release in, uh, of the hydrogen sulfide. And um, for some reason, the community got very angry about that. And we had this meeting in, in the community center about it. And uh, Shell's people were at the front of the table. And they were really trying to placate us with stupid answers. And, and we're not a stupid people. You know, no, no more. Um. <laughs> um, and, and so I stood up and I said, you know, what do we want 
We need windows and doors because some of these houses when you drive through have the same windows and doors that were installed in the house when it was built in the 70s or the 60s or the 50s. And by closing me in that house where the vapors can seep in, I'm just killing myself faster. In that case, I'm better to open it to keep the flow of air moving. So give us windows and doors. And you know what they gave us for that? Little FM alerts. Cost about $7 each. And they don't even work. And they don't work. They were, they were notifying us that there's a thunderstorm coming. Yeah. But when there was um, incidents happen, there was nothing coming through. What's FM? Uh, it's just a little alert that, that uses an FM signal. Oh, okay. So okay, if FM there's an radio, alert, okay. it's supposed to go beep, 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 and it sounds uh -huh. like a fire alarm in your house. And what it is, is the St. Clair Township, just south of us, it's their fire chief who puts on whatever it is. So I said, I'm going to only get half a story for what's happening across the street. Anything north of across that street, we're not going to get the information. But there's been a few incidents that were happening, you know, small little fires in the lab or, you know, fire somewhere, but they got it under control, but still not telling us anything because there's always a potential that that small fire could lead to something even bigger, right? Yeah, yeah. But... Um, you must hear about something like Black Magantic and just quiver, right? I mean, cause, well, cause usually when you... And, the time, but the, the problem is they're not even sounding the sirens when things are happening. Like when the, the one, my daughter came here and she could smell it like 10 to eight in the morning. She, oh, mom, it's bad. And I goes, on your stink scale, one to 10, what is it? And she goes, it's a 10. So, but at that time I had a cold, so I couldn't, wasn't smelling too well. So I went outside and I'm taking the air sample. And at that time it was like a seven or eight that I was cutting through my cloth nose there. But there was a little girl next door waiting for the bus, just standing out there. I made my daughter run out, you know, when her bus came, plug your nose and just go run and whatever. Well, you're, you're touching on something that's uh, in, uh, skirting an issue. And not, okay, all of the health things are the health things and they are what they are. And, and where we are is where we are and what we've done to the community has opened their eyes. And, and really before we started doing this, everybody's eyes were closed. Um, you don't have to be an educated person to come to this community and see that something's wrong. But now that you know, what if you don't have the financial resources to leave here and your children are impacted? You know that. How, that now that's eating at you. And you have to sit here when an alarm goes off and nothing follows it. There's no, nothing on the radio. We don't have television cameras here. We don't have TV stations here. The nearest stations in Windsor, London, or Detroit. So there's oh, no we do coverage. we have Channel 6, the Kojiko. Yeah, but, we have a Kojiko channel. But um, you got to watch. So, but the point of it is... We have to carry around the, the, the cancer inside of us, which is the fear. Living in fear every single freaking day. Do I let my kids go out and play? When they had the really big release in, in, in January, hydrogen sulfide, animals died. So little Sparky was on the front porch and she made sure to lock up the house, but nobody thought to bring Sparky in. You know what I mean? All of these things hold on you. My children were born with impacts from Chemical Valley. They, uh, we did that to them. And that's what I would tell the Ministry of Environment too. I goes, you know, so normally you get up, get your kid up, feed her breakfast, out the door you go. If you get outside, the bus will be coming. I goes, should we be training everybody? You go out and sniff that air before you send the kid out. Should that be something we should be teaching? And they're going, no, Eden, no, that's not, you know. <laughs> It might be a good idea, but no, you shouldn't have to do that. But not everything would be smelled either, would it? I mean, well, it, right, because yeah. the one time we went to the cemetery with our bucket, the air sample thing, the bucket brigade, and we were just taking a background sample at the cemetery, and there was four or five different chemicals that were found that weren't accepted in the States, anywhere in the States. And I said, wow, you know, that's really scary because, you know, I go back there to visit my loved ones all the time and I plant flowers and stuff like that. So I'm breathing this stuff in without even knowing.
my dad, Clarence Rogers, he was for the U.S. Army, World War II. But we have a lot of the, uh, you know, the Army, everybody that, you know, because everybody always thinks we forget. We, we fought. Let me take you back a minute, Ron, to just for what you said. I, do I understand this right? That that the air quality was was so bad that that you basically lock everybody up inside the house, don't go outside, and your pets who are left outside die. Well, is that what you told me? Yeah. I mean, never mind the pets. Well, no, but the, uh, but if the pet no, no, dies. No, no, but your little have, baby could too. We right? have uh, hypothetically we have a chief and council that oversees what happens to us, and they care about their their their, their citizens. Um, we have deer, we have duck, we have fowl, we have raccoons, we have beavers, we have all of Stuff these things eat. around us that, that don't have somebody speaking for them. And they were out there for it. Sparky never comes in the house. He's outdoors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We know 20 people, if we thought about it quickly, whose animals never come into their house and they're being exposed to all of this. Well, we're paying the vet bill or the dog died. Uh, with the incident with the uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide, one band member's baby, they had brand new baby, six or seven weeks old, had pictures taken a couple of days before the release. A couple of days after the release, the baby was full of red blotches like chemical burns all over its body. If this was happening in Toronto or Hamilton or Ottawa or in Montreal, London. this would be on the front page of every paper. But we don't have anybody here to cover this. So well, it doesn't get out. The daycare kids, well, actually, with the one release from Shell, there was 30 people that put their names in that saying they were affected. So the one girl, she works with the environment department, her daughter, they're, like from the daycare over just over this way from us, um, a lot of the daycare kids were affected. So they had the red eyes and crusted eyes. So they went up to the hospital to check it out. And they're, oh, that's just part of the flu. You're, they'll be all right. See, when an incident happens, they're supposed to notify the hospitals and the medical officer so that they can look for these things, you know, you know, okay, this is what we released. These are the symptoms you should look for. So they were all misdiagnosed, you know, it's just... We we're talking about really massive, almost deliberate negligence. Yes. Right? And, oh, and, yeah. and on every, on almost every scale, yes. almost every official... We had a, a, I mean, we had a benzene release come out of Nova Chemical when it's now called Styrolution at the time it was Nova Chemical. And it was at that time the largest benzene release in Canada. And, and it started early in the morning. It went all day. The next morning, our children were waiting out in front of the band office for the school bus while this release was going on and they didn't sound the alarm. It was a hot September day. So everybody had their windows open and all this benzene's rolling on through. And the next thing you know, they're telling the, the, the people at the band office they can't go to work and they bring in sniffers and they find in the band office, it's way above the acceptable levels. They find everywhere around that end of Amgenong, it's way above acceptable levels. And our, our, our band council are so brainwashed by industry, they bring in one of industry's safety guys named Archie Kerr to explain to us why we don't have to worry about this. And n I'm an adult. I made a conscious decision to move back to Amgenong. She's an adult. She made a conscious decision to stay in Amgenong. Our children should not have to be threatened in this way, in any way. And nothing happened because of it. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, because like even the last time worked, they didn't repay the ban for when they had to evacuate the workers or anything like that. And then when the guy was from Nova, reading the levels that they had found of benzene he's reading them real fast like I was excuse me are you going to give me a copy of that and he said no so really and then uh, when we're out years later out in toronto the 419 initiative where all the government and industry folks are there and this that guy was on the phone i happened to remember his name so i say excuse me can i give me the microphone and i goes yeah one time at this industry they did this they had benzene and the guy read off the, uh, the results so fast and he wouldn't give me a copy. And everybody was, oh my God, oh my God. And then the guy that was on the phone, he goes, um, whoever that is speaking, you just give me a call, I'll give you a copy. 
give me that microphone back. I was, you are the person I'm talking about. You know, and then everybody, oh. <laughs> but you know, all the other industry guys that were there, representatives, whatever, they're all going, what is going on? We couldn't do that where we were from. You know, they're out by um, Sudbury and different areas, and they're going, what? That would not be allowed where we're, where we're at. And I was, yeah. So they learned a lot too for us being there. Like, I don't claim to be an expert on nothing. Although a lot of people turn to me for, so I know a little bit more than the average person, maybe, I don't know. But I, I know when I can throw in comments or add to it because I've lived it, I've been to so many meetings. I, you know, hear everybody speaking and what kind of questions they're asking and I'll ask, why did you ask that? And Well, that brings us to another large area, which is that the impression I'm getting and uh, is that, uh, that what you have here is almost like a separate state within a state. And then Amshlam is a separate state within that separate well, state. But, it, but it's almost as though there is no government here. There is simply a corporate presence that governs. Right? Well, that's why we is had uh, uh, Gord Miller come here, the Environment Commissioner of Ontario. We held a jurisdictional meeting, and we had the top people from all the little jurisdictions around here. There was, yeah, they were pointing fingers. Well, no, that's them, that's them. And, uh, Indian Affairs said, well, we're responsible for their land, not their health. and. You know, they're all point fingers. Oh gosh! See, at the end, like, because Ada and I have been to go, the, the the people they turn to, and neither one of us are, are ever went to school for this stuff. We we got to where we were because both of us are willing to go. What does that mean? We had no fear of looking like looking stupid. What? Is, and every person that I ever asked, what does that mean? didn't hesitate to sit down with me and go, oh, well, and they explain it. Okay, well, now I don't have to ask that question anymore. So the community turns to us. And when we had the Gordon Miller meeting, there was never a meeting like this ever taken place before. And what we wanted out of the meeting was, who do we call? We don't want to waste our time calling you if it's not your responsibility. We'll call him. If it's not his, res we want to walk out of this meeting knowing who to call when this happens. And the report, it's online, I can get you a copy of the report from Miller's office. Um, we were supposed to have several subsequent meetings that never took place. And but you never he, really got an answer to that question either, no. right? Well, he, what they, because all the toxins that were found throughout the Telford Creek that comes through the southern part of the reserve, there were really high levels of different toxins. And he said, well, we said we never produced those. <laughs> you know, we didn't do that. And so he said, well, obviously it started on provincial land, so provincial should be cleaning it up. They haven't cleaned it up yet. We found a myrite, uh, which is a, a contaminant in the soil in Amgenong, that is, um, de they say deleterious to fish. It kills fish at any detectable level. So uh, th this is several years ago. I called the Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans, which is supposed to govern the Fisheries Act, which is actually used to be the strongest environmental law in Canada. Well, that my right's illegal in Canada. It's never been what produced that here. That's my isn't it? So how did it get here? How did it end up in our creek bed? Obviously, <laughs> companies here are dealing with chemicals that are illegal in this country. Right. And nobody's catching them. And we caught them, and they refused to investigate it. Yeah, because where we found the, the, the my uh, that's what it is, um, it's actually over the, the train railroad tracks where the creek goes underneath that. Oh, okay, it's the trains then. But see, when we had somebody come down and do the test, and he said he couldn't tell if it's historical, you know, it's been there for 30 years, 50 years, or if it's only been a week, he couldn't tell. So, you know, they suggested more testing and that. So. Well, it sounds as though they, every time you turn to any of these guys, they say more testing, more research. Everything. And then, any we study we've ever done. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're not going to do it. We um, that suggest it should be Really, done. honestly, I, we don't need any more test on. We don't need any more surveys. We don't need any more studies. We've been studied to death. The air is what it is. The World Health Organization said this is the most contaminated air shed, which has never been used in the terms. It's been a watershed, never called an air shed. This is the most contaminated air shed in Canada. And they measured that off particulate fine and ultra. So that, that's pretty nasty. So take me out of the, to the suit. How does, how, does this, how does the suit come out? You, you, you've obviously been trying many, many avenues. To well, yeah, get we tried writing letters. Yeah. We tried all the other steps without going to court, without, you know. So 
So what takes you to the point of, of doing the suit, and how, and how does that happen? Suncor was given permission to build a new stack, and it was to be so high because the solution to pollution is dilution. So the higher up it is, the larger uh, disbursement uh, it is. They built the stack one-third lower than what the certificate called for. So the, the carbon, carbon dioxide coming out of it, hmm. is it dioxide? Anyways. The diesel desulfurization uh, yeah. unit anyway. So what came out of it, because they built it a third lower, just rains on top of Amgenon. It doesn't hit non-native population in any way. So the province let them do this. They let them build it lower than the stack was required by, by their own certificates. And um, so much so that after a couple of years when we raised this and raised this and, and, and applied to the minister for reviews, um, the ministry made this big media hoopla about fining Suncor for doing this wrong. And they were to cut production down in the plant by so much so that they would hit the approved levels. Uh, so there's the acknowledgement that the plant was, had built this wrong. And uh, some time later in a director's order, which is a piece of paper that nobody in, in Ontario was privy to, it's not a public document, um, the director said, go ahead and ramp back up to 100%. So they acknowledged the harm to human health by having the stack so low, the emissions so high, and then some time later in a secret document, they tell them to go ahead and ramp it back up. So they acknowledged the harm to human health and then allowed it to continue. And that's uh, uh, the Suncor side of the story. Because um, while we were fighting the Suncor ethanol plant, it went away. And in the meantime, that's when they got the approval to put the uh, diesel desulfurization unit in. And uh, we were questioning about it and we wanted to talk to Suncor. We kept asking them to come and talk to us. And, tell us you know what's going on and they weren't coming so we had talked to eco justice and they were the ones who notified us that they got shut down that plant got shut down that desulfurization unit got shut down and they said well Ada why don't you call and ask for that paper and I said okay what do I ask for what do I say just tell me what it's called. I don't know what it is. So they told me. So I called up. Hi, it's Ada Lockridge calling. I, I understand you gave approval or you did this. And they said, uh, yeah. I was, okay, I need a copy of that. I'll be there in 15 minutes. You can have that at the front desk, right? And they said, yeah. <laughs> so I went up and I got it. They had it ready. And I'm, oh, I don't know what the hell. So I gave it to different people to read. And they're going, what is this? I've never seen nothing like that. Is this the director's order? That allows yeah, one of the director's okay. orders for okay. shutting them down and that. So... And we happened to be meeting with the Ministry of Environment at that time. And we were saying, like, what are you going to do? And they go, well, you have to talk to them. We go, well, will you be there? Like, we don't even know what to say and, and how they're going to treat us. And they go, we'll be, we'll be there, but you have to, uh, Suncor has to tell you. We never did get a meeting with them. And until we went to court, that's when Suncor had to write to say what happened so that the judge would know. And so in layman's terms, so okay, I can read this, I can understand that. But it was their whole plan that was wrong right from the first, like right from the get-go. The engineering's drawn was wrong, how they did it was wrong. They got shut down, they let them go back. They, I don't know, there were so many different things happening. They were going, wow, this, like, you know, it would have been different if they would have gave us that information right at the beginning too, but they, they wouldn't give it to us. We had to wait till we were in court to find out what it actually meant. But they, it, it illustrates the lie because they came to us and said they were building a diesel desulfurization plant. Now, we can get behind that. I didn't know that. I didn't um, know about it, that one. It, it's that good one for the environment, right? Remove the sulfur from diesel. But it was a lie. So they said they were going to build the ethanol plant to distract us from the lie. I don't believe they ever intended on building the ethanol plant where they said they were going to build it. The desulfurization plant, which is called the Genesis plant, is the largest bitumen processing unit in Canada. It was built to process tar sands bitumen. The desulfurization was uh, um, the removing uh, of the, the, the diluting chemicals that have, are added to the bitumen to keep the flow. That's what the whole unit was built for. But they had us looking over here while well, they did this right here in front of our noses. We were actually blocking the road in eyesight of where they were constructing this plant, mm -hmm. inside of a plant so you don't really notice it. 
So you, so you, you take them to court, basically, or you, you, it's not them that you take to court, it's, it's the provincial government. No, no, it's both. Suncor is involved, the provincial okay. government's involved You have involved to well. name an industry. Okay. And so that's the one that we're talking about, is the diesel desulfurization unit. So we went by the last certificate of approval that was approved without consent, knowledge, um, consultation. Anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason why industry is fighting this so hard is because um, they have to now, in the court documents, release in layman's terms what they're doing. So now it's public fodder. So you can ask for it and the paper can ask for it and the TV station can ask for it and actually report what's going on without the hidden jargon or the proprietary information stuff. So industry is fighting this tooth and nail. We went to court. They tried to tell us that we couldn't sit down because they had um, all the seats for lawyers. They had so many lawyers oh there. My goodness, yes. They weren't going to let us sit in our own trial yeah, they or hearing. They tried to tell Ron to move. He goes, I'll move. And he goes, well, we need it for our, our lawyers. And we said, so what? You see those guys? Those are our lawyers. We're sitting here. So what is it that the suit seeks? I mean, if, if, if the suit succeeds, what will happen? If you win, what happens? Um, well, on the Charter Challenge, um, it will become uh, an enshrined right that you are able to walk out your door and breathe air that isn't harmful to your health. And to feel safe in my own home. Because uh, when those plants get going, it'll shake my house, and, you know, the windows rattle and stuff. And sometimes you hear that boom, and then you're, oh, wow, and then woo, and then the phone calls come, and then you're grabbing the phone, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's going on? So you know? um, that's the outcome. To um, breathe clean air, feel safe in our own home, and to be treated equally as anybody else. With we're that, not asking for money. Nah. No, yeah. What we're asking for is uh, cumulative effects be considered in every decision, as it says in the law it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And what we're expecting to happen out of that is uh, uh, the government's going to come back and say that we don't have a method of measuring cumulative effects. They've told us that. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that they come back with that because then we'll propose methods. And um, it really will shake the earth. I mean, there's a couple of really big cases that are happening in Canada, and ours is one of them. And it will, it, it will change the playing field. And you're saying it'll have an impact in places like Pennsylvania and California, too. Tell me how that works. Well, uh, California and Pennsylvania are the two most progressive states in, in the United States. And they're paying very close attention to what we do because how this wording comes out of, in, in the ruling is how they'll introduce it into their legislatures. Okay, so the, the governments of those states are waiting for a wording that they can use in legislation. Similar it's wording, not, yeah. It's not so much that they're looking at this as a precedence that affects them. Oh, no, it won't they, affect them, but uh, <coughs> it won't affect Manitoba. I mean, it, we're, we're, at, we're in an well, Ontario court, right? Yeah, it'll be persuasive, yeah, but it'll be persuasive all But it'll same. be a ripple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's... It'll be, a, it'll be a, a case that can be cited anywhere. And may, the, the amount of its impact may be but different. But yeah. really, we are witnessing um, the strength of industry. I mean, we, we, we filed in 2010, we're 2013, heading into 2014. Other than a motions hearing, we haven't been to court yet. You know, they're saying now it's going to be September, October when we defend our affidavits. That was supposed to happen two and a half years ago. So every stalling tactic can, that can happen is, is happening. And we were forewarned about that, though. And like I said, you know, for me, I'm not going nowhere. I'm right here. I'm all I'm going to do is tell the truth anyway. And I just keep building up more information each time. And I still I'm still learning. So I'll, I'll wait. I'm ready. But how many lawyers uh, boats have we bought? Cottages have we bought? I mean, this whole team of lawyers on the, uh, you know, the other side. What are they getting paid per hour? To sit there in a courtroom all day long while one lawyer who hogged the microphone for the entire day. Oh, a day and a half. When <laughs> he said he'd be a half a, half a day, but he looked like an idiot, though. He was talking to the judge of Suncor's lawyer. He sat there and went on and went on about the what, the first certificate of, of approval, 2002 or something yeah, like yeah. that. He kept going on and on about that, wasted a day and a half. That's not the one we were talking about. We were talking about the 2010 one, right? Yeah. That's the one we were talking about. What Suncor can say, you know, what the government can't say, Suncor will say, and what Suncor can't say, the government will say, well, yeah, we got their tactics. But this guy from yeah. the province, he screwed it up so bad. 
It was, I mean, uh, thank God for us. Yeah, but, yeah. You know. tell, but, me about, see, tell me about the eagle feather. This eagle feather, that's one of the highest honors you can get if you're ever given one. And um, when we were fighting the Suncor ethanol plant, I didn't know. I, I just do what I do because I feel it's in here in my heart that I have to do it. So I did it. And there was a group of us after the Suncor plant went away, they had a powwow. Um, we have a powwow every year. And the family, the Plain family, decided to honor people with the eagle feather. So we got it. And uh, that was my first feather I ever got. <laughs> But the scary thing is that when we did our dance and I was hugging an elder at the end and my feather is start twitching. It start right in my hand. I was, oh my God, well, I'm holding the elder and I, oh, I almost knocked him down, but I did it. <laughs> but I, and it went down to the ground and I start crying. Oh my God, what does that mean? What does it mean? And people were telling me different things and they were saying, oh, they don't have to give you that feather back. I was, oh no. So the guy had to talk to me, the guy who gave us the feathers. And he said, no, hang on to that. Don't let that go. And uh, because they said when I get all stressed out and that, that's my medicine, you hold that and you know, you speak to it, whatever, it calms you down. And I just looked at it as my job's not done. I have to keep going. This, it, just that Suncor thing, that, that ethanol plant, that wasn't it. There, it's further, I gotta go further. And I kept doing it and I, and I don't know why, but something guides me, something's telling me what to do and what not to do, some things I won't get involved in. So it just guides me along and uh, calms I, you and gives you a bit of a compass. Yeah, Is that and fair? yeah, yeah it's, right? it's a healing. I don't know. It feels good, and I, and I just I don't know why I did this. And then the court case come along, and I was going, wow, maybe that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I, you know, maybe that's what it was all about in the first place. I don't know, but I'll just keep going with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, cause I noticed you came with it when we started here, and I thought, you know, this is obviously an important thing to have with yeah. you for this event. And uh, yeah, I've yeah, never earned yeah. one before, so I. I, I <laughs> That's fabulous. That's fabulous. <laughs> well, I interrupted you. You were you both. Well, yeah, I was just um, like in that hearing, the other side. Um, each said that this is going to the Supreme Court. There should be a public inquiry as to what's going on and that something is definitely wrong in Amgenau. That's their lawyers making these all statements. All three of them. The judge said it. Suncor lawyer, government lawyer, they all said, oh, there is something definitely going on down there at Amgenau or in Sarnia area. But what was this the right court for it to be in? So when it came back, the judge, yes, agreed that, yes, this is the right court. Because they were saying we should have went here, we should have did this, we should have did that. But what our lawyer said, we couldn't if you're keeping everything a secret. You know, it has to be out there for us to know what to do, but you never did that. Finally, um, uh, and this has been fascinating, and, and uh, well, I guess not, not quite finally, two other things. One of them is, uh, it's my understanding that when people like us come with cameras and so on and so forth, it's as though we are no longer in Canada. It's as though, <laughs> it's just as though we've entered another country where plant security is actually the is actually the government is that is that correct they conduct themselves like they're the authority of the police they will pull you over um, they will harass you they've tried harassing us once or twice but uh, <laughs> not often when i was uh, with him when i'm in my vehicle they don't bother me i'll just give a wave or i'll pull over what are you doing now and stuff like that they I, we're known for sure yeah we're, yeah we're very well known for it but uh, the, the best story of it all was um, when we had the lawyers from Ecojustice with, and we were doing a tour around and we pulled up to the Clean Harbors gate. And the reason why I take you to Clean Harbors, if you had time I would take you, is they have a sign that says no hazardous waste beyond this spot. And in the background of that sign perfectly placed is the stack with all of the emissions coming out from the incinerator. So no hazardous waste beyond this spot. I don't know if that means coming in or going out, but it's a good picture. And we were sitting there and, and uh, uh, Justin got out of the van and a couple of other the guests got out of the van and they were taking the pictures and um, they got back in the van when an unmarked vehicle, a guy with no marking on him at all that said he represented anybody, pulled over beside the van and said, uh, what do you think you're doing? And Justin just looked at him and said, fuck off, go on, Ron. And away we go. Because if you give them the authority, they'll have it. You know, they, they he we stepped were, in front we of the van. We were at the other thing there, and they come up to us too in front of Lynx's or whatever. When Justin was out there taking pictures, and yep. they came up. <laughs> but uh, they, this is public property. You can't tell anybody. Like our, uh, the guy who's a photographer of Sarnia Observer, our newspaper, forever. 
he was out there taking pictures of Lynx's new sign and they tried to get harass him for being on the other side of the road and taking a picture. And this is a, this is pretty astonishing. But you know, when Suncor, when uh, we were fighting the ethanol plant and we were, you know, kind of parked down there, camped down there, we weren't letting no cars go through. And then Suncor come to chief and council and they thought um, that, you know, they didn't know what we were gonna do, you know, something could explode. I was, do you really think we're into killing ourselves? We don't even know what you have over there. Why would we try to do anything to that? We're not into killing ourselves. Get that through your head now. But. Finally, let me just turn to the Idle No More thing, which is, uh, and one of the things I guess that's striking to me um, is that the Idle No More protests across the country were essentially designed to draw attention to the gutting of the environmental regulations and the and the impact on First Nations without any consultation. And like that, there were some big general grievances that applied across the country, but yours was quite specific as well, wasn't it? You had a, you, you know, you, you, you were not just blocking a railway, you were blocking that railway for certain specific reasons. But right? um, yes and no. The, uh, I don't know more from the, the Theresa Spence angle was based on uh, treaty infractions. Um, Attawapiskat being Attawapiskat, and I don't want to go into the whole issue of Attawapiskat, but uh, every community has had horrendous treaty infractions that, that result in this. Uh, to, you know, be fine about it, but um, it, a few years ago, the Assembly of First Nations asked us to do uh, roving blockades, block railroad tracks, highways, miscellaneous uh, ways of inconvenience. And that was when Sean Brandt and Tyan Danega blocked the line that went from Toronto to Montreal and that made all the press because it was the big line. And he was able to block that track for 24 hours and then they left the tracks. Well, that same day, we, uh, the drum that I sing on and myself went to the tracks on Tajmu Avenue, the, the, the same tracks we blocked this time. And we found out later in the day that uh, um, an injunction was already issued to get us removed from that tracks. But we took it down at five o'clock in the afternoon for whatever the reason we decided to do that. And it was the chief who pulled over and he said, you know, like an injunction was issued and the next time we're going to do this, we should block the tracks on Williams Drive because there's no uh, permit for them to cross those tra that road. This time, um, the chief and, and a counselor and some other band members uh, went and blocked the tracks a little f in between Williams Drive and Tajmu Avenue. And they said that the, they put up the blockade uh, in support of Chief Spence, but uh, more as a way of awaiting the, the arrival back of our band members. We had sent buses to Ottawa on the 21st. And uh, if you remember, the 21st of December was a horrible day. There was sleet and, and ice, and it was just a... So they said they would leave the blockade up until the buses got back. And the chief and the councillors, uh, they left, and the people that were there decided to keep it up. So the next morning at 10:30 uh, in the morning, CN police showed up and, and dropped off an injunction written by a judge named David Brown, and uh, um, stating that they had to uh, leave this part of the tracks, mile marker, whatever the mile marker was. And I had shown up and I said, uh, "Well, okay, well, we'll move it from here to the next where I know they don't have a permit," uh, and that. Uh, um, ends the, the injunction because the injunction was specific to this mile marker. Uh, and uh, CN came back on the 27th of December with a new injunction saying that all of that line had to be uh, cleared. That line didn't serve anybody. It, and, and that was the, the, the point of it. When we blocked it on Tajmu Avenue, it served only the, the petrochemical industry. So they let Sean Brandt block the busiest passenger rail line in Canada for 24 hours we couldn't block a single line that feeds petrochemical industries for a day. When we did the second one, Judge David Brown was a former lawyer for CN. He, in fact, had served as a witness for CN in U.S. hearings. And he was the judge who wrote an injunction to have me taken off the tracks. And he didn't declare a conflict of interest. We didn't leave the tracks on the 27th of December. The Sarnia police, the OPP, the RCMP all followed the Ipperwash inquiries to the letter. They brought us coffee. They came and socialized with us. There was never uh, an authoritative thing about it. The RCMP never showed up 
but they sent a, a liaise through saying we're only here if violence is to break out we're you know and it was a very peaceful so that wasn't an issue um, because of that David Brown uh, charged or CN charged me civilly with contempt of, of a court order and uh, they brought in the Sarnia chief of police for not obeying or enforcing the court order and and wasn't Mayor Mike no nope, no nope. so uh, I got served by Facebook on January 1st at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon that I had to appear the next morning in court. I called my lawyers and my lawyers said, you don't have to appear. Um, and the judge stated that if I didn't appear, I would have been sent to jail. It is legal to serve you by Facebook in Ontario. Um, I never heard of that. Yeah, no, nobody has. It's a has. new law. <laughs> it's a new law. So uh, it, it, I, I showed up. I, between 3.30 on January 1st and 10 o'clock in the morning on January 2nd, I photocopied three file boxes full of files that showed that the tracks were there illegal. And they wouldn't let me submit them as evidence in court. CN at no time ever in all of this ever said that we have a right Must of way. Must be 12.30. CN never said, never had to prove that they had right of way to be on our property. They just had to say that they did and an injunction was issued. The judge said that the blockade's coming down by six o'clock that night or I'm going to jail and the chief of police of Sarnia is going to jail. And we agreed to take the, uh, we got the tracks cleared. Um, I went back to court on the 4th of January expecting everything to be dropped. And uh, CN told uh, the judge to me that if I gave them $5,000 there, they would drop it. Um, and I said no. And the judge said that if I don't drop it, I'm going to face 180 to $200,000 in fines. Ron is. Not Om Chanong. Ron is. And I said, well, why am I the only one here? Where's my, ch my chief who's named on the injunction? Where's the you know, uh, uh, counsel who's named on the injunction? I'm not named on the injunction, but I'm here. And CN said, in an effort to maintain a good working relationship with Om Chanong, they decided not to pursue them in this. Mayor Mike Bradley said later, in a meeting he was at, Am Janong struck a deal with CN. I'm left out in the cold. Uh, uh, the head of one of the national unions in Canada was, uh, uh, on my behalf, reached out to CN to say, what are you doing? And CN said, if the chief of Am Janong and I and this individual were to come to a meeting with CN and this individual would serve as a mediator, they would drop all legal and Am Janong wouldn't come to that meeting. So I got found in contempt of a court order. I'm the only person charged and uh, convicted of uh, uh, a charge as a result of I don't know more. And they gave me a $16,500.87 my, my fine. That's a test every Monday at 1230. You're not supposed but to normally, tell them. But, but normally, yeah, usually when you hear it, you'll think, what day is it? What time is it? But that's, if you're outside, that's to warn you to get inside. So if you're inside and you didn't hear that and you come outside, you're on your own. Because they only sound for a little while. And we didn't even arrange this. Yeah. <laughs> we just happened to be here. Uh, well, we, I, you're usually much closer to the siren at this time. But so, so that's the idle no more thing. And, and Right now where we are is, I have four lawyers representing me um, and they are really good lawyers. They made me a deal I couldn't refuse. Whatever we fundraise is their, fun, is their fee. Um, and the only caveat on me is all hard costs. So when they came here for court, I had to pay for their mileage and I had to pay for their hotel and I had to cover their food. So if they needed to bring in an articling student, I would have to pay for that. Um, so we raised uh, uh, a fair bit of money there and it's still incoming and then after the fine was levied uh, we began a series of campaigns to pay the fine off and we'll have the fine paid off by the end of September absolutely and when the fines paid off we're going to hold a celebration we're going to stand up and look at both Am Janong, the provincial government the federal government and CN and say we're still here you know you didn't hurt us you didn't scare us because that was the purpose of it, to scare everybody else here from doing that. 
you know, the propane association went to the prime minister and told him that we needed this track opened up because their uh, uh, clients are hurting. Um, we hurt them. We made a statement and we hurt them. And, and the member of parliament from Guelph came here and said that these tracks, what carries on these tracks would not be allowed in any other community, First Nation or not, in Canada. But they run, what's the closest house to the tracks? 50 feet maybe? If that. CN but is the worst polluter in, in Chemical Valley. One of the trains, the train closest to my house, I don't know, is that CSX? Yeah. It went off the track. And, you know, people are sending me pictures. Hello, shit, it is off the track. And there's nobody even there. And da, 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 da. So I know that, like, I got the mayor's in both towns, phone numbers <laughs> or cell numbers. I got everybody's cell numbers and stuff like that. So I, hey, what's, you know, something's going on. The train went off the track. Well, it didn't totally fall off, but it was off the track. Like, it didn't tip over, but it was off. And he was very angry. He goes, why were we not notified? But we're not leaking nothing. No, you go off those tracks. You are to notify people. You can't just do that. Like, it was right there where everybody's driving and seeing, like, and, you know, they try to keep a lot of things secret, but we got everybody watching. You know, even the non-natives that don't live around here, they're watching all the time. And I don't know if you know this, too, from our, like, our door-to-door -door health study that we learned about the miscarriages, the breathing problems, the lack of elders, and the behavioral problems and stuff yeah, like that. Lack of elders, people just don't live that long. That's but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but from that, the city of Sarnia decided to d make this other Lambton Community Health Study. They've been working on that for quite a few years now, too. And, um, but all they're doing is waiting for Om Janong to do more studies. But what we did with that, because I'm part of the board of that, because I work with the victims of Chemical Valley. And uh, so I'm on the board with them. And um, so we did open houses at, in uh, Petrolia, Corona, Om Janong, Sarnia, and Forest. But, and we did an online survey, too, and, and telephone random telephone call surveys and like 80 percent of the people that live near the whole question is people living near industry is their health affected like, i mean that's the main question why do we need thousands of dollars to find that out like everybody's going well where you don't know that why do you need money to prove this you know what why what, and it's still going on but anyway now they're working with health canada because health canada kind of started it but then they walked away so they're asking Health Canada for money. Yeah, because that Health Canada guy, he came, like, they kept saying they were doing this in-kind service. So he goes, what's your in-kind? Nobody's even met you. <laughs> Who are you? So they sent this retired guy down, and he only worked for a while. And we're saying, you know, okay, Om um, Janong did share their studies that they have done, which I pretty much was involved in every one of those studies because he wanted to question everything. Because when they introduced him to me, he goes, oh, you're Ada, that's me. And, uh, you know, he, he looked at the birth ratio study. He looked at this and he was going, he was finding some faults. And they're going, mm -hmm. and then he goes, but no, it does exactly prove that. And they're, oh, you know, and we worked with the Univer University of Michigan. We did blood, hair, urine, nail samples. And so our, the kids had higher levels in them than the, some of the parents did. So there were quite, everybody was concerned about that what's going on with that but it, like we knew that it would show us what levels we have in us but no meaning like what does it mean yeah you know yeah just a number yeah. yeah well that and, and the the excuse is we don't know who to blame you know there's there's all of these refiners around who did it so uh, the, what they're doing okay they started the health study i want to say that's five years ago yeah there and about um they've done nothing but grab headlines in a newspaper that we're going to do a health oh, study. Oh, barely, barely. Um, health Canada came. I was there. They say, you know, we're not going to contribute financially to this. So the, the, the industry said they would. And we all objected and said, no, if industry pays for it, honest or not, it's still going to look skewed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, but Health Canada paid for the very same study to take place in Fort St. John. And it's already done. In the time that we've been arguing to get the money to do it, it's already done in another community. They don't want to know what's happening here. Well, quite a few months ago, they, uh, the group had got together. If we do not get the funding within six months, we're dismantling the group. 
Yeah, I figured that would happen all along, but I'm still going to stick in here and I got to say what I have to say and when I got to say it. Because we had hired somebody to take notes and we knew it wasn't going to be verbatim, but they missed a whole lot of things. You know, the, the ladies from um, Corona Daycare talking about grapefruit size um, tumors on these little kids, daycare, and you know, all the puffers that these kids need, all, you know, the ADD medicine and all of this stuff, you know, it's everywhere in the high schools, public schools, the kids got to line up. There's whole trays of the kids coming to get their meds and they're not putting this stuff in there. So I had to raise a big stink about that. So if you actually looked it up online, it'll say Ada's notes to it because I made them include my notes because, you know, we paid the money to do this, but you can't leave that kind of stuff out. No, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. But, but one, one, uh, sorry, uh, you know, you, you asked earlier on about you know, how do we keep going or why do we keep going? It's, um, they expected us to stop when we did the first blockade on South Vital Street and we won. Um, they didn't give us what we'd won, but we'd won and we didn't stop. Um, they oh, no, because the barrels came right back yeah, after that. There it's was just like been, 400 Once you barrels. opened our eyes, it was one thing after another thing after another thing after another. And it's just, it, it's never stopped. Mm -hmm. All we did was... Recording and... But more than that, I mean, when, when I feel really mad or down or something, I'll phone her. Or she'll phone me. And, and everybody else comes, they stay for a while, they go, they come back, they stay for a while. Because it is really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Some, I, I, I can't explain why. Maybe it's when I'm down, she pushes, or when she's down, I push, or however it worked out. We're still here. You know, we have survived four Suncor plant managers, um, two managers of the Sarnia Lampton Environmental Association. Um, we've survived everybody, and we're just not going away. So my fear is, um, you know, the, the mortality rate in Amjanong is 55. Well, I'm 51. Um, I won't live to see this get court. Are you saying that the 55 is the life expectancy in Amsterdam? That was out of the uh, study that we did, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that, like Stats Canada, First Nations are polled differently or separately. And yeah, we had zero for the one age group grouping. But I, what I was told that if there's five or less, they'll make it as a zero as not to point people out or something like that. That's what I was told. I think you're too stubborn to go away even that way. Well, <laughs> only the good guy, young Ron. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> it's not about the pollution. It is for it, me. It, it, it's, I want us to be treated equal to the people on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in this case, uh, the people in Corona or, or the, the town on the other side and the people in South Sarnia they're the exact same as us. The difference being is they're not Indian, but they're poor. So uh, they've got, no, like I explained about the political system, they've got nobody fighting for them. So that's why when we go to a coffee shop, people are like, hey man, I saw you in a paper, thanks for speaking up for me. Mm -hmm. Because they have nobody speaking up for them. They have no means to do what we did. We're using our Aboriginal status to push this marble faster. And it's, um, we were at the one open house in Sarnia and the one guy got up and he goes, I want to talk to all the First Nations people here. I am sorry for what, I've worked in the plants for this many years. I'm sorry for what we've done to you. I know it was wrong and I wanted my job and now I'm the one suffering with cancer. I'm sorry, I need to apologize to you. And I get that all the time, all the time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you know, they needed the money, they needed whatever and that's. But I don't begrudge you a dollar. I mean, if, if, if you got a job at the plants, if you came to me tomorrow and said, I got a job at Suncor, I'd say, thank you, congratulations. I mean, you need to feed your family, I understand this. But what you can do for me while you're working in Suncor is let me know when things aren't right. Mm -hmm. That's all I ask of you. Because you know what, it pays well, benefits are good, and the reality is Walmart's not gonna put your kid through university, you need a good job. So. I'm not opposed to anybody getting Her daughter got a job at Suncor, which was really ironic because we were going hard at them then. Um, <laughs> but it was yeah. a good summer job. It was a summer job, yeah, she applied. I was, well, they might not hire you because of me, but they might hire you because of me. And then they did hire her and uh, she applied for a job. But you know what? They came up with a whole new job title just for her, a whole new job. 
environmental health and safety. That wasn't even one of the jobs that she applied for. And so they hired you because of me. And then she didn't have a ride home. I couldn't get her. And they go, well, we'll give you a ride home. And, she, and they're going, is it okay to pull in your driveway with our, the vehicle? Is it okay? <laughs> I guess there's one other one that I want to ask. I've been um, spending a little time trying to understand more about the First Nations view of the world. Because I think if we get things like the Earth Rights thing, we will find the whole community has moved much closer to the traditional native understanding of things. You know. But how does it make you feel, given the native, and I know there's not a single native, but given the sense that Mother Earth is, our, is the source of it all, and Mother Earth is the thing that should be reared, how do you feel about that as someone with that understanding of the world? She's sick. She needs help. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. It's that, all that contamination's running through her veins there, all the water and everything. And if we don't protect our water, what's going to be left? You know? But it's not just about humans, is it? It's no, about no, no, right? and it's, it's our about future generations. Right? It's the animals, the food that we eat, everything. You know, like I got pictures of the poor fish that are all tumored up and stuff like that too. But it's the future generations, and you know what it is too. Um, okay, so everybody's got these cancer cells in them, but it's something that triggers it to bring it out. So nobody knows what that is, but. You know, what is it? 90% of our deaths here are a cancer of one sort or another. And, you know, people try to do the smoking and all this stuff. But we had, you know, two, one kid was in grade 8 and one was in grade 9. That same year, they both died of leukemia or whatever, of a cancer. You yeah, know, well, that kid wasn't doing that. He was just, you know, he was into sports. He did, you know, everything. And, you know, it's kind of sickening how things happen. And it's not about money. It's. Well, I was struck when you said about future generations, you weren't talking about human beings first. The first thing you said was the fish, the animals, those generations, right? And I don't think that's something that would occur to a settler mind. Well, you know? I know I know the one guy, he, he was also on the environment committee, he goes, we got to talk for the animals. They can't talk. They can't do this. Like, I was doing yard work out here, and the birds were just coming right up to me, like, I mean, like, as close as your foot is to me, and I was like, oh, oh, you're getting a little brave, hi. And he was just watching me, you know, fill in the dirt and stuff. And I said, you want me to talk for you, don't you? That's what you're doing. And, you know, and it's so weird because all these little animals, the rabbits are coming right up. And they're not normally that friendly, you know. <laughs> but, but there you sit with a feather yeah, I know, talking for I know. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm doing this. I don't know exactly why, but I do it. I, like I said, I'm following my heart. And I pray to the Creator, to God, and everybody else that's gone on before me to help me, guide me, let me know what i got to do, and I'll do it. I, I didn't know what the boreal forest was. You know what the boreal forest is? Mm -hmm. Most people have no idea what it is. But I, I ended up on this thing called the Boreal Learning Network. And uh, it taught me what the boreal forest was. It's this ring of forest that goes right around the top of the earth. Uh, and it's kind of like a halo. And um, if you pay any attention to astronomy, the earth expands and contracts like this and um, it does it four times a year and it, it expands and contracts like this and we referred to the boreal as the lungs of mother earth and so the teaching goes we breathe a finite amount of time in an average person's life and i don't know what that number is i'm sure we could google it but the earth will breathe that many times as well only it is a pulse so that's the expansion and contraction of it. And as we uh, decimate the boreal, we're taking out the lungs, just like smoking cigarettes, just like the pollution from here and what's running in the water. So it's having a harder time breathing. And now the poles are shifting and it's having a much harder time breathing. Uh, that's the, the, the clearest way that it was explained to me of what we're doing to Mother Earth. The other part to that and the end to that is, um, we're like fleas on her. She could shake us off tomorrow and carry on just fine. She doesn't need us. We're dead without her. So make sure that she can breathe. And uh, it's a very visual way. You can picture that in your mind. Ron Plain and Ada Lockridge, the native activists who are the plaintiffs in a Charter of Rights and Freedoms case that could transform Canadian environmental law. If you enjoyed this interview, you'll probably enjoy our interview with David Boyd about environmental rights around the world. And you might want to take a look at another project called Green Rights.
You can find out about that project at www.greenrights.com. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.